So today we are in part three of a six part series called Why We Follow. Now, if you're not a Christian or you didn't grow up in church and you have wondered or often been confused about why your Christian friends seem to make such a big deal about Jesus, or maybe you did grow up in church, but you've been frustrated with how complicated it can feel sometimes. Well, this series is for you and it's for me. And it's really for anyone who wants to be able to clearly articulate why anyone should follow Jesus and be able to have an intelligent conversation about it. Now, as we've talked about before, following Jesus is actually pretty logical. Let me explain. If someone predicted their own death and resurrection, which Jesus did, and pulled it off, I mean, that would mean there's some source of power greater than our time and space who would reach into our time and space and raise somebody from the dead. So, if someone predicted their own death and resurrection and pulled it off, <laughs> we should follow whatever he says. Now, <clears throat> if this sounds logical to you, but it doesn't sound reasonable based on your experience with the world, I mean, I get it. I mean, you don't want to believe everything that you hear. Really, whether you follow Jesus or not, you can probably agree with something that his great-great-great-great-grandfather said one time. His name was Solomon. Solomon said, the simple believe anything. I mean, you know people, you probably have friends, family members, and others that you work with. They just seem to believe anything, but you're not like that. He said, the simple believe anything, but the prudent, that is the wise, give thought to their steps. They think, they reason. Now, you should know that Christians, we don't, we don't believe without reason. We don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus without reason, and neither did the first people who heard about it. And that's why uh, Saul of Tarsus, who we've talked about before, who uh, we often refer to as the Apostle Paul, in a letter to a group of people who had kind of forgotten why they had believed in the resurrection, takes great care to lay out, here is what is most important the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And then here's the reasons for why we believe that. So in this letter, let me just read you an excerpt. This is what he says. He says, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. Meaning, everything else I've taught you and everything else I'm going to teach you is secondary to what I'm about to say right here. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And then He gives the reasons behind that. This is what He says. He says, and that He appeared to Peter, and then He appeared to the twelve. After that, He appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then He appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. There is so much packed in there that in this series, we're kind of breaking that down a little bit so you can understand the importance and understand the reason behind why we follow Jesus and why we believe in his resurrection. Uh, so today, I want to pick up where Caleb left off last week with Jesus appearing to Peter and then to the twelve. That is the twelve apostles. The apostles, the people that Jesus had been with the most over the last year and a half to three years. The people that uh, had known him the most and the ones that he had given responsibility to, to be eyewitnesses to his resurrection in Jerusalem and to the whole world. Now, there's an argument that some make that he, maybe he didn't actually appear to Peter, and that maybe he didn't actually appear to the twelve, but maybe they just made up the whole story. Maybe the apostles of Jesus stole his body and made up this resurrection story. This is at least what the people responsible for Jesus' death, that is the chief priests of the temple in Jerusalem and the Romans, this is at least what they said when they heard that there were apostles claiming that Jesus had been resurrected from the dead. Now, the apostles said that that was just a rumor. So we ask the question today, were the apostles telling the truth or was it just a fraud? 
Now this is really important, so I want to just pause right here and have you recognize, those of you who are Christians, I mean, you recognize that your faith in Jesus is largely dependent on how much you trust the Apostles' testimony. Those of you who are not Christians, your friend's faith in Jesus is largely dependent on how much you trust and how much they trust the Apostles' testimony. I mean, the Apostles wrote like eight of the 27 documents that we have that we call our New Testament or our Christian Bible. And they contribute, directly contribute to at least four other of those documents. So much of what we read today in our Bibles comes from their testimony. So how much do you trust them? And quite frankly, based on what we know about biology, I mean, the claim that maybe the disciples stole the body and hid it and made up a resurrection story, it actually sounds kind of reasonable, doesn't it? I mean, <clears throat> we know that cells, human cells that die, they don't come back to life, let alone a whole body of cells. So we ask the question, are they telling the truth or is it a fraud? Now, I have some personal experience um, with fraud. As some of you know, my background is in public accounting. I worked in public accounting for a little while, and some of my favorite projects that I got to work on were fraud projects. One of the projects that I worked on uh, resulted in a settlement of $179 million. Now, that is a lot of money, and it took a lot of people working together to pull it off, or at least come close to pulling it off. Now, in accounting, when you're considering whether something was a fraud or whether there was fraud in the business, there is um, a helpful tool called the fraud triangle. Now, I don't want to bore you too much with this, but the fraud triangle basically has three factors or three elements of fraud that cause fraud in a business. The first is opportunity. For example, in a business, uh, if someone was wanting to um, embezzle money or steal money from the organization, um, if the, there's an opportunity, for example, it could be um, like weak internal controls or the systems that are in place that protect the organization's money or protect the owner's money or the shareholder's money. If those systems are weak, it makes it easier than it should be for someone to pull off a fraud. Now, when you consider the apostles and whether they had the opportunity to really even steal his body and make up this story, uh, we have to acknowledge that in their own accounts of what happened, they acknowledged up front that it was disciples of Jesus who had originally gone to get his body from the Romans and take it and bury it. There were a couple of them. They took his body, they embalmed it, they buried it. And then we learned that only a couple Roman guards stood outside to guard the body. And when you consider the number of disciples that there were, I mean, it does seem possible that they could have, you know, charged the tomb, overthrown those Roman soldiers, taken the body, hid it, and then made up this story. It's at least possible. Well, the other uh, element or another element of this fraud triangle is rationalization. I mean, this is where somebody in a business who's trying to pull off fraud or is tempted to pull off fraud might rationalize. I mean, I've been working for this company for a long time now and I haven't gotten a raise or a bonus in three years. I mean, I deserve this. I deserve what I'm taking. They'd rationalize their behavior, rationalize doing something that they might not do under normal circumstances. Um, now, when you consider about the apostles and how they could have rationalized this fraud, hiding the body, stealing and hiding the body, I mean, you think about one, one way they could have rationalized this is thinking about how corrupt the temple system had become, how corrupt the chief priests, those responsible for leading the people of Israel, how corrupt they had become. And then when you factor on top of that, the oppression of the Roman Empire on their people, I mean, and those two people working together, I mean, maybe they thought, hey, let's steal the body, let's hide it, and just to embarrass the temple and embarrass, embarrass Rome. I mean, maybe they thought that they deserved this kind of humiliation. Maybe, it's possible, right? Well, the third uh, component, the third element of fraud is motivation. There's always a motive, right? I mean, every uh, whodunit murder mystery, there's always a motivation, and there's always a motivation in a fraud. I mean, you think about in um, a business fraud, um, if somebody was tempted to pull off, pull off 
um, you know, some type of uh, fraud within the business, embezzling money. I mean, they could be motivated by needing to pay their medical bills or maybe their uh, compensation package includes some type of incentive that if they just tweak the numbers just a little bit, they could get a larger bonus. Well, when you consider like, what could the apostle's motivation have been for pulling off this type of fraud? I mean, one thing that comes to mind is maybe they just wanted to save face. You know, maybe they just want to save face. They've been following Jesus for a year and a half to three years, and then he's died. I mean, he's turned out to not be the Messiah that they thought he was. Really, in his big moment, he didn't even put up a fight. I mean, how humiliating is that? Maybe they just thought if we steal the body and hide it, then we save face a little bit. Hey, yeah, he's resurrected from the dead. Maybe, maybe, right? It's possible. So when we consider whether this is a truth, whether the apostles claim that Jesus came back to life is truth or a fraud, I mean, this is a pretty serious consideration. Well, the good news is that as this history was being made, <clears throat> as the apostles were coming and they were proclaiming this resurrection of Jesus, and then later after the fact, there was an unbiased third party investigation that investigated everything that had happened. Now, scholars believe that this investigation, the person behind this investigation, was neither a Jew nor a Roman, but actually a highly educated Greek doctor named Luke. And that Luke went and he investigated everything so that his readers could have certainty about what they had heard about the resurrection of Jesus. And I believe, and I believe that Luke came to believe, that the uh, question about whether the apostles were telling the truth or whether they were trying to pull off a fraud lies in how they responded when they were interrogated and how they responded when they gained influence among the people. I mean, surely the apostles knew that if they were going to try to pull a fast one on the temple and they were going to try to pull a fast one on the Roman Empire, surely they were going to be questioned. And so in Luke's report, which is pretty revealing, he lays out how they responded in those moments of question, interrogation, when they gained influence with the people, how they responded, and how they responded when they were under severe pressure. So I want to walk through a couple snapshots of those and let you make the decision of whether you think it was a truth, they were telling the truth, or whether it was a fraud. Now, in Luke's report, he says that when the apostles came and they began teaching to the people and telling the people that Jesus had been resurrected from the dead, they caused quite a stir, which is pretty much an understatement. Um, they started gathering lots of people. Lots of people were coming and they were listening to their message about Jesus' resurrection. And one day there were some priests and the captain of the guard of the temple came and they were listening and they were watching the disciples and all these people coming together to listen to them. And they were pretty disturbed by this. So they arrested two of the apostles, Peter and John, and they brought them before the high priest and all of his family. I mean, you almost get the sense that they were being brought before the mafia. Well, after the first round of interrogation about what they were doing and why they were doing it, the uh, priests were kind of stumped. I mean, they sent Peter and John away for a minute, and they're talking, and they can't figure out how to disprove what they're saying and the claims about the resurrection. So they bring Peter and John back in, and they basically tell them, you need to be quiet about this resurrection and this whole Jesus business or else. I mean... Clearly, they were concerned that if the apostles were telling the truth, their own power and their own authority was in serious jeopardy. So they tell Peter and John, they say, you need to be quiet or else. But this is how Peter and John responded. Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes to listen to you or to listen to him? <laughs> you be the judges. As for us, we cannot help but speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. I mean, they are standing before some of the same people who had put Jesus to death, and they didn't back down. Now, as they were released and they go back out, they go back with the other apostles, and they began continuing to tell the people about the resurrection of Jesus. Now, as they're telling people, they're gaining more and more influence, and people are listening to what they're saying, and they're acting on what they're saying. 
And their response, the people who had listened to the apostles, their response is actually pretty telling of what the disciples were getting at. It says this, it says that when the people heard them, all the believers, that is the apostles and the people who were believing in the resurrection of Jesus, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything that they had. Isn't that crazy? I mean, if they had made up this story to pull off some type of fraud, I mean, them sharing everything is pretty unlike every other fraud that's ever happened. Rather than serving themselves, they served others. And as they continued to talk about the resurrection of Jesus, more and more people, daily, more and more people came to believe, which caused the, the priests uh, who were, you know, a, a part of this uh, temple, it caused the priests to be furious about this. So they came and arrested not just Peter and John, but this time all 12 of the apostles, and they put them into jail. Now, something crazy happened with the jail. But as they, uh, as they were in jail, they actually got out of jail and went back into the temple courts to preach the gospel. Now, uh, meanwhile, the priests who didn't know about them leaving the jail Meanwhile, those priests had called uh, the Sanhedrin together. That is all the elders in Jerusalem who were responsible for judging really big cases like this. They brought them all together and they sent for the apostles who they thought were in jail. And when they went to the jail, they found out they weren't there. And somebody said, hey, those guys you put in jail, well, they got out and they are back in the temple courts talking about the resurrection. So the priests are really upset at this point, and they call the Roman guard, they go and they bring the people before the Sanhedrin. They bring those apostles before the Sanhedrin. And it says they were ready to put them to death because they were so angry. But then a teacher who was among them, his name was Gamaliel, he stood up and he began to reason with the priest and the whole Sanhedrin who were together. And he says this, which I think is pretty interesting. Gamaliel says, listen guys, other people before Jesus have claimed to be somebody important. But when they died, their followers dispersed and everything just kind of faded away. Everything just kind of moved on. And there were multiple cases of this happening. So just let it play out. If this is just a man-made thing and they're just kind of making something up, this will begin to fade away. No leader, no followers, no cause, no more problems. But if this is of God, I mean, you could be standing in opposition to God himself. Now, it seemed to persuade the priests a little bit because they cooled down and decided not to kill the apostles. Instead, they just had them flogged and whipped and then sent them on their way with another threat saying, don't talk about Jesus or the resurrection again. And this is how Luke reports in his investigation that they responded. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name of Jesus. They counted themselves worthy. They were rejoicing. And that day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah and that he died and he came back to life. Even with their intense pressure, even with being flogged and beaten and embarrassed, they persevered. But it didn't end there because others rose up to challenge the apostles. In fact, um, some uh, more people got together who were concerned about the apostles' claim about this resurrection. And they took one of the apostles' um, helpers named Stephen. I mean, Stephen was helping the apostles and he was helping this movement of Jesus' followers. And they took him and arrested him and questioned him. And Stephen responds about this resurrection of Jesus in this really profound and incredible way, ending it by saying about the priest, you murdered the Messiah of God. You murdered him, but he came back. Now, those priests and those people in charge were so furious that they began picking up stones and throwing them at Stephen until he died. They stoned him to death. Now, on that same day, 
in Luke's report says that on that day, the day that Stephen died, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Isn't that crazy? I mean, house to house, going through, pulling out people who believed in the resurrection of Jesus and, and you know, persecuting them. Those people started fleeing. Everybody started running except the apostles. They remained. And they remained focused on what Jesus had told them to do, to go be his eyewitnesses of his resurrection. Now, later we find out that one of the apostles, James, the older brother of John, was murdered because of his boldness in preaching the good news about Jesus and preaching his resurrection. So we know about Stephen being murdered, and we know about James, and later we find out that likely Peter and others were also killed. In fact, other sources outside of Luke's investigative report say that eventually all of the disciples were killed. We don't know exactly, but we do know this. And this is what I want you to understand in their response, and whether this is a truth or a fraud. This is, this is how they responded. The apostles endured torture and embraced death so that the world could believe that Jesus came back to life. Does that sound like a fraud to you? Someone who would endure torture and embrace death because of what they believe? Now, you may argue, or some may argue, yeah, but other religions have martyrs too. Other religions have people who are willing to die for their faith. And, and that's true. I mean, there's Buddhist monks, and there's Muslim radicals, and there's others who are willing to die for their faith. But this is the unique part about Christianity. And the unique part about the apostles' response is that the apostles were willing to die because of what they had seen with their own eyes. Others may be willing to die for what they've received secondhand, but they, they had seen it. They had seen him. Some of them had touched him. They, they knew. They believed. Now, other objections include that, well, maybe they just saw a hallucination. But now what we know about modern medicine and the, the human brain, we know that it's biologically impossible for multiple people to have the same hallucination because a hallucination happens inside the brain. So, I mean, 12 guys having the same hallucination is not likely. And even more than that, I mean, not only did he just appear to Peter and the 12, but he also appeared to more than 500 other people. And Paul says, if you don't believe Peter and you don't believe the rest of the 12, I mean, there are 500 other people who are still alive. Go ask them. And another objection could be, well, maybe they, the apostles, maybe they were just crazy. You know, maybe they had just totally lost it. But let me ask you a question. When you consider the truth that they believed about the resurrection of Jesus, a truth that could change the world, a truth that if everyone made it the center of their life, I mean, it would eliminate hate and it would eliminate crime. It would even eliminate passive aggressiveness. I mean, how far would you go if you knew a truth that was that important? How far would you go to make sure that others knew the resurrection? I mean, their response really was not all that radical because Jesus coming back to life really changes everything. Now we asked the question, was this a truth or a fraud? I believe, and I hope that you can see, that a fraud is really unlikely. Was it, whether it was the truth or not, I mean, that still remains to be seen. But consider this. The voluntary death of the apostles does not prove the resurrection is true. It doesn't prove that. But it does show the depths of their conviction that it is true. It does show the depths of their conviction that they would not stop at anything. They would endure torture. They would endure death. They would do whatever it takes so that the world could believe in what they had seen and what they had heard. It shows the depths of their conviction that it's true. Maybe you're sitting there thinking, yeah, but that just sounds too good to be true. Maybe. Well, there's actually something else that I want you to know, and I want you to hear, and I want you to be able to articulate as well. 
It's actually a someone, someone else that you should know. And he had doubts about Jesus' resurrection too. And he probably knew Jesus better than anyone. And that is where we are going to pick up next week. We're in the series, Why We Follow. And I look forward to seeing you next week.